Welcome to the Moss Report with your host, Dr. Ralph W. Moss. Hi, this is Ralph Moss, and I'm very pleased to have as my guest today, Dana Omen, MPH. Dana is one of the foremost spokespersons on the topic of homeopathic medicine in the United States. He's the author of Discovering Homeopathy, Medicine for the 21st Century, which includes a foreword by the physician to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. He also published The Homeopathic Revolution, which documents famous people over the past 200 years who have been known to use and advocate for homeopathic medicine. He has served as an instructor at the University of California in San Francisco and a member of the Advisory Council on Alternative Medicine for Columbia University's uh, famous College for Physicians and Surgeons. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome him today to the Moss Report podcast. Dana, welcome to the show. Can you very briefly explain to our listeners what homeopathy is? Sure. Well, first of all, a lot of people misunderstand homeopathy. They think homeopathy just is another word for alternative or natural or holistic. No, it's not. neither of those things. It's a specific a very specific way of using medicines, using very small doses, what I call nano doses of medicines. And the basic premise is a profound respect for evolution. And that by what I mean by evolution is, is that we as a human species have evolved because we get exposed to infective agents, we get exposed to stress, and our body does all that it can to survive. And a, so all too often in conventional medicine, when a person is sick and they develop symptoms, we assume that that sickness is something wrong with their body. When in fact, actually, the symptoms are ways that our body is trying to survive. And those symptoms are actually part of our defenses. So when we take medicinal agents to suppress that symptom, we are therefore suppressing the body's defenses. And from a homeopathic point of view, one of the reasons why we're having so much immune breakdown, immune dysfunction, uh, and chronic disease is, is that we've been treating various acute ailments, fevers, coughs, headaches, you know, simple acute responses of the body that are the body's defenses, and we're suppressing that defense. We're not enabling the body to really heal. We're providing a short-term benefit, but creating a long-term problem in the process. So quite different than medicines that suppress symptoms, in homeopathy, the very word homeopathy is taken from two Greek words, homeos, which means similar, and pathos, which means disease or suffering. And the principle of, in homeopathy is to use a very small dose of whatever a substance causes in order to heal them. More specifically, let's say, you know, um, uh, the onion. You're cutting an onion in your kitchen, and as you're cutting it, it causes the tearing of your eyes, you know, a running of your nose. And mind you, these symptoms resemble sometimes symptoms of, of a cold or sometimes symptoms of an allergy. And so homeopaths would use a nano dose of an onion if and when a person has not just a drippy nose or runny eyes, but the unique fact factor of exposure to an onion is, is that the nasal discharge is of a burning nature uh, and, um, and the symptoms are worse whenever a person's cutting an onion in a warm room. So if a person has a cold or an allergy with a watery nasal discharge that is that sort of irritates the nose because it's of a, a burning uh, discharge, uh, and so much so that you might even use a Kleenex and you think, well, I've got a bum back of Kleenex. My, this Kleenex is really hurting my nose. The Kleenex isn't doing that. It's the nasal discharge that is irritating. My point in giving this example is not just that, that onion causes these particular symptoms, but in homeopathy, we don't use a medicine based on the disease that they have, but on the unique syndrome of symptoms that every substance causes. 
So in this case, if a person has a cold or an allergy, which is worse when they're in a warm environment and or inside, it feels better in the outdoor air or cool air, that might be an indication for a very small dose of an onion. Now, the whole idea in homeopathy is, is that the principle might even sound a bit like a vaccination. And in fact, the first scientist to ever win the Nobel Prize in medicine did so for discovering the tetanus vaccine and the diphtheria vaccine. And he claimed to have gotten the idea from the homeopathic principles. And he was only able to say this after he won the Nobel Prize because in the uh, early 1800s, to express any interest in homeopathy was like saying you're a gay communist. Uh, I mean, it was really, really frowned upon at that time, even though the very founder of homeopathy, Samuel Hahnemann, was a very prestigious doctor and chemist. And so once you realize that symptoms are defenses, you look for a medicine in nature that might, if given to other people, cause the similar symptoms that you're having. And uh, because that nasal discharge, let's say you have a cold, that nasal discharge is full of dead viruses and dead white blood cells. And then the body uses this liquid substance called mucus as a way of ridding the body of, of this dead particulate matter. And if you use a conventional over-the-counter drug, which dries up your mucus membranes, and it doesn't allow your body to create the mucus, then you can imagine what happens with all those dead viruses and the dead white blood cells. They congest. And so instead of coming out of your body, they congest your respiratory tract. They not only make your nasal discharge worse, they can and will lead often to re other respiratory problems, coughs, bronchitis, and, and more serious respiratory conditions. So we've turned a very common, simple infection into now a more chronic problem. So what Hahnemann and other homeopaths since the early 1800s have found is, is that when you're using a medicine whose symptoms resemble the symptoms, whose symptoms of toxicology resemble the symptoms of a, the sick person, the person's body is like a radar. They just need a really nano dose of that as a, as a way to elicit a healing response. And for 200 years, homeopaths have treated a large variety of acute and chronic and even hereditary ailments. And in fact, homeopathy was so popular in the early 1900s in America, there were 22 homeopathic medical schools uh, and medical schools that you know and respect today. Boston University was originally founded as a homeopathic medical school. University of Michigan, Ohio State, uh, New York Medical College was called New York Homeopathic Medical College. Um, Hahnemann Medical College in Philadelphia, named after the very founder of homeopathy. University of Minnesota, and even that radical University of Iowa in middle America was earlier a homeopathic medical school. Yeah. And many of our cultural elite, the leading literary greats of America, from Mark Twain and William James, Longfellow and Thoreau, uh, Emily Dickinson and Louisa May Alcott, all big advocates of homeopathy. Well, because I mean, Dana, but wouldn't the, you know the the skeptic would say, well, that was because medicine was so bad in the nineteenth century that you know even doing right. not, nothing would have been better than than what they had. Um, but what is the what is the basic reason for the antagonism of the American medical profession against homeopathy? I run into this all the time. Sure, sure. Well, there's what, two primary reasons. One, m most homeopaths are medical doctors, not myself, but uh, many, most practitioners throughout Europe and in, uh, in the world are, are medical doctors. So that's threatening in and of itself. And a part of our analysis in homeopathy is much of what conventional medicine has done and is even presently doing actually does more harm than good. I don't want to say all of medicine is bad. I would never say that. My father was a medical doctor, a pediatrician, and an allergist. Mm. But we don't, and doctors have always said, well, in the past we were dangerous, but now we're safe. Well, like I said, they've said that every decade. 
and we question it because the very premise of much of conventional medicine is whatever the body's doing, it's wrong. And whatever symptoms are having, the best way to deal with it is to somehow inhibit the symptoms or even suppress them. And in so doing, we provide a good short-term benefit, but ultimately create greater immune suppression and dysfunction. Okay. Now, the second reason that homeopathy is threat is a threat to the conventional medical and scientific mindset is because we use extremely small doses, and we use such small doses that the conventional doctor and scientist says those are too small to have any effects. But actually, today we know several things. One, besides all the research that's been done on homeopathy, we'll get into that. But in fact, as it turns out, many of our own body's um, neurochemistry uses extremely small doses of these different um, uh, cellular systems, uh, cell signaling systems, neurotransmitters. They are at the super nanodose level. And the best research published in major scientific journals today has found that although homeopathic pharmacies do this process of making the medicines through a process of diluting and shaking, diluting and shaking, and diluting and shaking, and although conventional doctors say that's done so many times that you don't have any of the original molecules left, the best research published in journals, for instance, published by the American Chemistry Society, have concluded that these nanodoses persist in the water solutions. And they will not have any effect unless the person's symptoms happen to resemble the toxicology of the substance. And then our organism be develops a hypersensitivity to that substance, and it creates a powerful immune response. Mm. All right. So you're saying so, that it uh, that that the I mean the the standard argument is. Oh, you know, there, there's nothing left as you, I'm just repeating what you said, but I think everybody who's yeah. heard about it has heard this, that it's like, like a, one drop in a twi uh, of water in a swimming pool or something like that. Or well, well I, I, actually, let me explain one important thing that, that yeah. might clarify things. Cause this was a study published, like I said, in a journal called Lang Mirror, which is published by the American Chemistry Society. And they tested six different homeopathic medicines that were diluted one to a hundred, 200 times. Mm -hmm. And using three different types of spectroscopy, they were able to find nanoparticles of the original substances. And let me explain why. When they take a, a substance and dilute it, they might take a plant, mineral, animal, or chemical and put it in, in a double distilled water. So they not only distill water once, they distill it again to create the highest level of purity in the water. Mm -hmm. And then they use glass containers, because if they use metal containers, the metal would leach into the water and contaminate it. Yeah. We didn't think that would happen with glass, but in fact, it happens with everything. Mm -hmm. And here's what happens. When the pharmacy does these dilutions and then shakes the, the test tubes vigorously, that substance blanches against the side walls of the glass, and conventional scientific research has found that when that substance blanches against the side walls, little nanoparticles of silica fragments fall off the glass walls and into the water. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't create any toxicological problem. Our body filtrates all these nanoparticles all the time. But what ends up happening is because of the turbulence from the shaking, the medicine is pushed into these silica fragments. And then when the manufacturer dumps out 99% of the water, a lot of these fragments just cling to the glass walls. You can't get them out. And now modern technology through spectroscopy can find nanoparticles of the original substances in the water. Once again, they will not have any effect on a person unless that person happens to be hypersensitive to that substance. And then if a person is given a nanodose of a substance whose toxicology matches their own symptoms, that elicits that immune reaction that we see as healing.
Yeah. And so the study that was done at the University of Vienna and published in that major oncology journal called The Oncologist, this was just the third study that this group of scientists had done. And what was so remarkable about this study, it was done at the highest level of scientific inquiry and research. Yes. So they not only had everybody get conventional medical care, but they had three different groups. So one group, they got conventional medical care, and then they were given a homeopathic interview, and they were given a placebo. One group was given a placebo and conventional medical care. The other group was given conventional medical care and an, an homeopathic interview and then got a real homeopathic medicine. And a third group just got conventional medical care, didn't get the homeopathic interview or any homeopathic medicine. So the thing about research is sometimes a institution like a hospital or a university will not engage in research that deprives patients of conventional medicine. So this didn't deprive anyone of it. Everyone got their conventional medical treatment, but they found so dramatically that those that were actually given the homeopathic medicine as an additive had a survival rate that was not just statistically significant, but what we call substantially significant. Yeah. So uh, instead of at 200, conventional medical 200, group, 28 days for the people who got no extra treatment. Uh, that's survival. right. 257 days for those who got the placebo, the fake homeopathy, as it were, and 435 uh -huh. days for those who <laughs> yeah. got the homeopathy. So there was nearly that's, yeah. a double, a doubling yeah. of survival yeah. in the people who got the real homeopathy versus those who had no extra treatment. And as again, as you said, these are people who were getting uh, standard treatment for non-small cell lung cancer. I mean, right. these are blow away results. And the other right. thing, the other point that you, that you made, I'll, I'll draw a line under it, is that according to the title of the paper, this was a prospective, randomized, Placebo controlled, double yep. blind, three armed, multi center study. In other words, it literally ticked all the boxes for yeah. what we've been told for 200 years was lacking in homeopathy. That whatever small trials were done in the past, well, there's always something wrong with them. They weren't pers prospective studies, they weren't randomized, they weren't placebo controlled. Maybe it was all, uh, you know, just a, a mental effect and so on and so forth. And and there were numerous authors. Um, the, the lead author, Michael Frass, uh, your colleague, is at the Medical University of Vienna in the clinical division of oncology. And, and th there was no arguing with this. I mean, they literally did just about everything and anything that anybody would want um, to, to show whether or not this was effective. And I think anybody who's doubting this has to look at the paper and, uh, <laughs> uh, and it's mind boggling. I, I mean, yeah. I believe in homeopathy to the extent that, you know, I carry my Arnica around with me and uh, both in cream and in, and in pellet form. And I have a little case of homeopathic medicines right by my, my bed stand, but I, but I've always felt a little bit defensive about it because I couldn't really explain it. And you feel like a, a bit of a fool, I think, if you say that you believe something, but you can't explain it to people. So you thank you for that explanation because I I never heard that that those issues that you raised uh, before. Yeah, and published in a major scientific journal, published by the American Chemistry Society. I mean, yeah. wow! And by yeah. the way, there have been dozens of studies published in the British Medical Journal, in the mm -hmm. Lancet, published mm -hmm. in. Uh, Pediatrics, published in Pediatrics Infectious Disease Journal, yeah. published in the journal Cancer Itself, yeah, um, published in Rheumatology. Um, and um, by the way, just to let you know, Dr. Frass, for several decades, has taught a course in homeopathy at the University of Vienna. Mm -hmm. And shortly before this study was published, he was reprimanded and his course was withdrawn from the university 
So yeah. that's that. This is the penalty you get from doing good research, but yeah. don't, that doesn't provide the narrative that the conventional medical mindset supports. Yes, you're and right. it, it, right. I'm sure you're stunned yeah. to hear that. Well, I mean, this, now, is, now, this is you know so typical of so many things right. in, in the world and in medicine, but you know what what I was struck by. And you're probably very familiar with this. There is a, a gentleman in the in the UK who is a self-styled uh, opponent of homeopathy and of uh, anything non-conventional. In, in oh cancer. yeah, Edzard Ernst. Edzard Ernst, exactly. And he said, he said, one of the things he said about they've made a special target of Dr. Frass. I would say one of the things he complained was that Frass's quote-unquote sensational results are, quote, almost invariably published in very minor journals. So this is hysterical because if that's the charge, you know, that he only publishes in minor, which isn't his fault. I mean, he didn't go seeking out, I'm sure he didn't go seeking out the minor journals. But finally, you know, a top draw journal, uh, the oncologist, and a top draw uh, uh Fame, world famous oncologist uh, Dr. Uh, Bruce Chapner uh, chose to publish this in, in their yeah. journal. So that uh, you know, that's sort of George yeah. Robin, isn't it? Well, D- Dr. Frass and I submitted. I we wrote a review of research on homeopathy and respiratory allergies, mm-hmm. and we sent it to the journal Allergy. And you know, it was turned down within one hour. Within <laughs> yeah. one hour. Yeah. <laughs> and they see the word homeopathy in it, they immediately turned it down. So this is their trick. You yeah. know, it, it's like a catch 2,222. Where is the research yes. that we don't allow you to publish, we don't allow you to conduct, and right. we don't we ignore it even if it gets published. Yeah. And, and yet, by the way, Dr. Frass had published an earlier study in one of the most respected respiratory journals in the world called CHEST. And he did a study on patients with um, uh, COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is either emphysema or chronic bronchitis. And this is a disease that's so serious that it's the number three reason that people in America die. And what they did is, is they had earlier found that there's one homeopathic medicine in particular that is, it's a rare situation in homeopathy that one remedy can be given to many people with the same disease. Because most of the time, homeopathy needs individualized treatment. And it could be one of several hundred remedies. So, you know, in these cancer trials, there might be, you know, 30 or 40 different remedies used. Uh, amongst the hundreds of people. Um, But in this trial, they had such dramatic results, and this was randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, published in this major journal, and it cut the death rate substantially. It cut the the time in the hospital by a half. And, And then when other people tried to replicate this research, the hospitals wouldn't let them conduct the study. Mm. Oh, wow. So once again, this is the catch 2,222. Yes. And so um, uh, Dr. Frass's his work is impeccable. Uh, you know, just this week, uh, this Edsvard, Edsvard Ernst, mm-hmm. um, uh, he did a ridicule of a Dr. Jennifer Jacobs, who is a prestigious medical doctor at the University of Washington, yes. who conducted several studies, including one published in the journal Pediatrics yeah, on know. childhood diarrhea. Mm-hmm. And child, uh, childhood diarrhea is not a serious problem here in America. But according to the World Health Organization, several million children die every year from dehydration brought on by diarrhea. Yeah. And she's conducted several studies showing the efficacy of the individualized treatment of, of, of patients or children with diarrhea and um, 
Uh, so Dr. Ernst get, put her in his Hall of Shame because she seems to only publish studies that are positive about homeopathy <laughs> because she also does the highest quality research. And when you do high quality research, usually in conventional medicine, you get less good results. But in homeopathy, we find quite the opposite. We find that when you do good research, you often get good results. Yes. But also how many people who, who research chemotherapy publish negative articles about the chemotherapy? And uh, That's right. The, the funder won't let them publish them. So I, I want to I return for a moment to to the actual study, to Frass's uh, study, because I think, you know, our our listeners, most of whom, many of whom are themselves cancer patients, um, the, not, the normal uh, impulse would be, well, where do I get this medicine? And I think the first point I want to make and see if you agree with me is that this the treatment that people got, it wasn't like a, oh, take this vitamin or take this uh, nutraceutical or something. This was, the, these were individualized to those particular symptoms that the people were having. And I think this is the point that it's going to be hard for some people to, to fully grasp that they weren't treating these people's cancers. They were treating, as I understand it, they were treating the side effects and the quality of life. And by doing that, using homeopathy as a way of counteracting what is going on right then and there in these people's bodies, whether it's caused by the cancer or caused by the treatment of the cancer, by, by fixing those problems, it almost doubled the survival of the patients. And if you look at the big chart that they have a color chart that they have in the paper, you can see that about half of the patients um, were still surviving uh, two and two years later, and nobody had died after after the first 500 days. Nobody in the homeopathy group uh, who hadn't died up to that point had died, you know, had had died subsequently. Whereas only about 15 percent of the patients who were in the control group uh, were still alive. And I think this right. is profoundly, profoundly interesting and important that quality of life, symptoms, performance status, whatever you want to call it, 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 that's as much of a determinant of whether you will live or die as whether you shrank the tumor or not. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, some conventional medicine shows that a chemotherapeutic agent will shrink the tumor. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily lead to changes in the quality of life. Yeah. How is this ringing? It's the gods of conventional medicine are working against us. I took those away now. Let me let me go back in. Okay. Uh, we, we, um, yeah. Right. The the importance of the quality of life to the survival of the cancer patient. Right. So basically, one of the things I want to make clear about this study and about homeopathy in general is is that. Uh, every person undergoing homeopathic treatment is interviewed by a homeopath for at least an hour to not only find out what diagnosis they have, but their unique pattern of symptoms. And not only that's related to the cancer, but their unique syndrome of symptoms in general. Mm -hmm. And then a substance from the plant, mineral, or animal community is prescribed to the patient, usually by good homeopaths, we usually do one medicine at a time. Because uh -huh. when you're using one medicine at a time, you know what that remedy is doing. Because if you do more than one, you don't know which remedy is having the beneficial effects. And so these days, in fact, you know, I see most of my patients via uh, Zoom or Skype. And in this day and age, 
Um, it's wonderful that even during this pandemic, homeopaths uh, can have very busy practices because we can then send the person medicines. I have a personal policy of never telling the person not to do a conventional drug, but, but I do educate my patients about some of the drugs that they're on and they can make a decision whether they will slow it down or stop it, but that's not my decision to make. And I don't encourage them one way or the other. I just educate my patients. Mm -hmm. um, and so my care is what I call adjunctive. So it's in addition to whatever other care you're doing. So if you're under conventional medical care, it's not a problem. Uh, it, uh, if you're doing a variety of other natural therapies, that's not a problem either. Homeopathy would just be one part that I would add into the mix. And you're still seeing patients? You're accepting oh, yeah. patients? Oh, yeah. Busier than ever. And, what is, and what's your website? I'm a simple website to remember. I'm homeopathic.com. Oh, good. That's it. And, and then, you know, I'm real proud. I have a collection of 100 articles at my website. Plus, I have uh, 40 different articles at the famous Huffington Post. Mm -hmm. And if you do a Google for my name, Dana Ullman, U-L-L-M-A-N, and the words Huffington Post, you'll be able to see my collection of articles there. Now, don't go to the Huffington Post directly and do a search. They can only do searches for articles in the past year. And mm -hmm. most of my articles are older than that. Uh, you know, in the last five to 10 years, they've published a lot of my articles. And I'm very proud of them. Good. Well, we will definitely uh, let, our, let our listeners know about that. Um, one more question. What? How does one find a, a qualified homeopath in the United States today? Well, so, you know, of course, you, you do that with Dr. Google. You know, you, you do search for, uh, but it depends on if you want an MD homeopath. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want an MD one, there's the, the American Institute of Homeopathy, mm -hmm. which actually was started two years before the AMA. And when the AMA got founded in 1846, they said one of the reasons for their formations was to slow the growth of the homeopaths. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also some excellent naturopathic doctors that specialize in homeopathy. So the first thing I always recommend that you don't want just a person that uses or practices homeopathy. You want someone who specializes in homeopathy. Uh -huh. Because if they dabble in a whole bunch of different things, they're not going to be as good at homeopathy, which really requires a certain degree of specialization. Yes. And then, then there are what we call professional homeopaths, who are not naturopaths or medical doctors, but who have gone through the most rigorous training in homeopathy in order to be practicing. And that's that. the list of homeopaths there is through what's called the North American Society of Homeopaths, and their website is homeopathicdirectory.com. So I, I'm in that directory amongst many others. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my general, my conventional training is also in public health, where I got my master's in public health from UC Berkeley. And I was honored that uh, back in 1999, the University of California at Berkeley there alumni magazine did one of those five page interviews huh. with uh, usually it's it's Nobel laureates. But uh, in this case, they interviewed me. So nothing better than to have one's own alma mater like yeah. UC Berkeley nice. honor me with a detailed interview about yeah. what my feelings and thoughts about homeopathy are. Very nice. Um, Dana, thank you so much for this interview. I'm sure it's going to be absolutely fascinating for our our listeners and our readers. Um, the my my final question is: Do you think that homeopathy, in any sense, is winning this battle, or is it just is it surviving? Is it falling behind? How how do you, after having been in this field for so many years, how do you assess the current situation? Well, you know. Uh... You know, up until the tw early 21st century, there was really a lot of interest in alternative medicine. It was definitely growing. But, you know, big medicine is fighting and, and, and really taking out the big guns. But as it turns out, what people don't know 
is, is that homeopathy gained its greatest popularity in the 19th century due to our incredible successes in treating infectious disease epidemics of that era. I'm talking about cholera, yellow fever, scarlet fever, typhoid fever, these serious infectious diseases, quite different than the pandemic that we have now, which is comparatively mild mm -hmm. because these other pandemics you know, killed people of all ages and of whether they were healthy or not. Well, with this particular pandemic, it is mostly hitting the elderly. It's mostly hitting people that are already chronically ill, even with multiple comorbidities. So the difference in approach in homeopathy is to not attack the virus, but to strengthen the body's immune and defense system. And that makes sense. Yes. And the other thing that I'm trying to popularize, I call homeopathy nanopharmacology, a type of nanomedicine. Mm -hmm. And just nanotechnologies are, at the, are the future. And I think eventually homeopathy will be seen as an integral part of the medicine of the future. And everyone that's of an educated uh, mindset will seek homeopathic treatment, especially as a first method of treatment, because those of us that honor Hippocrates Remember the words first, do no harm. And that's why homeopathy fits that bill better than anything. Thank you so much. For Boss Reports, this is Ralph Boss. We would like to take a moment to thank our Patreon subscribers for helping to make this program possible. If you would like to have access to exclusive content, including transcriptions, episode recaps, and special offers, become a patron today at patreon.com slash mossreports.